Hello, this is Team Jury's FDR presentation. Our project deals with controlling the spin of a stretcher during helicopter hoisting operations. Introduction. During helicopter hoisting operations, downwash from helicopter can cause the load to spin out of control. This spinning has a potential to damage the helicopter, hoisting cable, and load itself, which might result in monetary damages and loss of life. Our group's proposed solution to this problem would be to build a stabilization device that can prevent spin when a stationary helicopter is hoisting up a load, specifically a stretcher. Context regarding this problem is the helicopter hoisting operation under low wind conditions where a helicopter is stationed positioned above a load, which is connected to the helicopter through a cable. The helicopter must then hoist up the load, pulling the cable up until the load is stored near the helicopter. The problem is relevant because such hoisting operations occur in rescue situations where it is necessary to res rescue a person stuck in a remote wilderness location. The design and mechanisms regarding the solution to this problem revolve around building a device that is capable of exerting a counter torque on the load or stretcher to prevent it from spinning. Uh, controls algorithms need to be implemented in order to control this anti-spin mechanism. The scope of this project is limited to designing a device with an algorithm that is capable of controlling one degree of freedom, spin, on a defined load stretcher attached to a stationary helicopter in low wind conditions. Below is a fish tree diagram demonstrating the root cause of the problem, unwanted spin on the helicopter load. The physical reasons for spin are downwash caused by a helicopter in low wind conditions. The problem is worsened when the load is surrounded by non-wind permeable material through lack of and through lack of experience and misunderstanding on the manpower side. Therefore, it becomes desirable to implement an automated solution that removes human error. This solution should be able to provide a counter torque to stop unwanted spin and should be able to deal with asymmetrical loads with high surface area. The problem of load spin is addressed in the Air and Med Rescue Magazine, which tells helicopter operators on what they can do to reduce load spin, as well as private company Vida in Canada Technologies that provides technical solutions to this issue. From the Air and Med Rescue Magazine, non-technical solutions to load spin include deploying the winchman at an offset position with an aircraft moving forward, decreasing the surface area of the load, and altering the center of mass of the load that is in line with the hoisting cable. However, these solutions may not be always be possible to implement. Vida and Granada has devised two relevant technical solutions. Both technical solutions are capable of controlling three degrees of freedom to handle 750 pounds to draw 1.5 periods per swing. Our solution is similar to the product shown on the right. Unlike Vida and Granada, our solution isn't a joint stretcher slash turbine unit, but instead a modular device that can attach to pre-existing stretchers. From our objective tree and morphological chart, uh, this is the solution we have arrived to. This design will use four ducted fans mounted on both sides of the stretcher powered by batteries and CPU. This design should be modular and should be mounted onto stretchers easily. Here are the pros and cons of our design. In the electrical subsystem design section, our system dynamics and control section, we address the solutions to the cons of our design, which include logistics and our control algorithm. The scope of the project is to solve the overall problem, the load stability of the helicopter. Uh, this specific subset of the problem involves, uh, we have a stationary helicopter hoisting operation with a defined load being a stretcher and we seek to reduce one degree of freedom, which is spin. Our approach is to build a device that exerts opposite torque on the load to counteract spin util utilizing ducted fans mounted at the top and bottom of the stretcher. We will test solutions to this problem using simulations such as SolidWorks, WeBots, and analytical simulations. Test, we will test systems under various disturbances and check whether they meet the safety requirements. For the electrical subsystem, we will go over the component requirements, the major component choices, the pin level schematic, and the bill of materials. For the actuators, we determine they must produce at least 12 newton meters of torque. And for a 1.1 meter moment arm, that means each actuator must produce at least 5.5 newtons of thrust. Looking at the um, comparison of ducted fans, we can see the 70 millimeter ducted fans produce four times the minimum thrust while also operating under 2000 watts. This gives us a good balance between power and battery life. For the CPU and IMU, 
we went with the Arduino Uno Rev3 for the CPU because it has the required PWM output pins, it has many code libraries, and has three volt and five volt output pins to power our sensor. We chose the Adafruit IMU because it's easily compatible with our CPU. It has the required six degrees of freedom and has relatively good resolution for our purposes. For the batteries, the ducted fan manufacturer recommends 22 volt, six cell, 35 coulomb batteries. Given that hoist operations typically take at most 13 minutes, our system should work for multiple runs on one charge. This means using 10 batteries per module gives us 30 minutes of runtime at full thrust. This means we can run at least two hoist operations on one charge in the worst case scenario. Moving on to the module electrical schematic, we see that both modules are identical. They connect to each other via I2C, and the PID torque command is sent from the main CPU via this connection to the sub CPU. Each module contains 10 batteries, which we have split into two sub batteries. The sub batteries contain five 3,500 milliamp hour batteries, which we will connect via XT60 connectors and one AWG wire. On the left, we have connected the, the balance uh, connectors of the batteries together in parallel to the balance output. Looking at the full battery diagram, we can see that the two sub batteries are connected in parallel. The balance outputs are connected in parallel and that will be used for charging. And on the right, um, the battery output goes to the main module and the charging input goes to the exterior of the chassis. We use one AWG wire because the motors could end up pulling around 130 amps. So we need really thick wire. Our current solution is to create a custom harness connecting these batteries, but we are looking into uh, high amp battery buses, which would make the, the uh, manufacturing easier. Looking at the electrical uh, bill of materials, we have all our components and their prices. And we see the total cost is just over $1,000. The physical design is a mechanical subsystem. Each component has its own challenges and solutions. In the most famous case of helicopter payload spin going out of control, there are approximately 12 newton meters acting on the stretcher. In order to counteract this torque, our actuators need to produce at least 5.5 newtons apiece, preferably more. We chose the PowerCon EDF 70 millimeter ducted fan. It has a maximum output of 16 newtons and weighs only 170 grams, or less than half a pound. We were unable to get the exact CAD files, however, we were able to find technical drawings and model a placeholder to aid in the design of our system. Mounting hardware has two sub-assemblies. There are the horizontal mounts and the vertical mounts. The horizontal mounts attach to the horizontal pipes of the stretcher, and they serve to keep the whole device in place. The horizontal mounts do not, however, prevent the device from tilting downwards. The weight of the device is held up by vertical mounts, which mount to the silicone vertical pipes on the structure. The two assemblies share the requirements of having to be rigid when locked into place and be able to accommodate for various stretcher pipe diameters. This device is meant to be compatible with any model structure, so it must keep the variance of structure parameters in mind. The horizontal mounts have the added requirement of not interfering with the chassis when an operator wants to disconnect the device from the structure. The vertical mounts should also not interfere with the chassis, but because they will be farther away, this is not a parameter we had to design for. The vertical mounts must also be able to account for different orientations of the vertical pipes in the stretcher, which are usually not vertical, and so we make no assumptions about the position or orientation of these vertical pipes. Lastly, the vertical mounts must be able to support the weight of the device. Here we can see the horizontal mount. A yellow bar is used to aid in visualization of how it attaches to a stretcher. The mounts use U-bolts to allow an operator to tighten the mounts to account for different size pipe diameters. Nuts in the U-bolt could be tightened, loosened, or taken off completely without interfering with the chassis. The U-bolts are off-the-shelf parts from a master car, and some of the threaded length was cut so that an installer could use a socket wrench to tighten and loosen the nuts. The vertical mount is more complex. To account for the unknown position of the vertical pipes, two ball and socket joints are used. One is a rod end ball joint, and the other is an inline ball joint linkage. The length of the threaded rod between the two ball joints can be changed and is held constant when adjusted correctly by two nuts on either side of the rod end ball joint. There's also a nut on the rod end ball joint that prevents its threaded portion from spinning. This vertical pipe mount attaches to the underside of the chassis and will be seen in the full assembly in later slides. Because we use two ball joints with three degrees of freedom each on the vertical mounts, extra degrees of freedom were a concern. 
He chose ball joints to account for various orientations and positions of the bars on the stretchers. An easier visualization for degrees of freedom is on the right, where the red lines represent the fixed distances between the bars in the stretcher and the distance between bolt holes in the underside of the chassis. These links are fixed in length and position. The black bars represent the threaded rods that span between the rod and ball joint and the inline ball joint linkages. The geometry of this assembly prevents the black bars from removing. In short, even though the joints are not locked, there is nowhere for the bars to move to. This design is robust and adjustable, however, it is not meant for a quick release scenario. The electrical housing, after revision to the electrical system, now exists in both chassis. This polycarbonate housing includes the Arduino CPU, the Adafruit IMU, the voltage regulator, and the several necessary connectors and wirings shown in the electrical diagram. This housing serves to separate the batteries and ESCs to the sensors and CPU for the sake of heat, orientation, protection, and ease of access. This housing will be located inside the middle of both chassis and will connect to the two ESCs, 10 batteries, and the on-off button in their respective chassis. A seven-foot Belden wire is used to send the IMU and CPU information of the main master CPU to the other chassis, which is on the other side of the stretcher. This Belden wire will have two three-pin wire connectors soldered on each side. They will screw into the females, which are installed on these chassis. This Juxili three-pin connector is made of nylon, is screw-on, waterproof, and erosion-proof. A cord protector will also be worn for the length of the seven-foot Belden wire and then placed inside the stretcher and then connected to the other chassis. All these precautions and preventative parts guarantee that the inadvertent tugging, critical cuts, and other forms of possible forcible disconnections of the electrical system will be heavily minimized and that the electrical portions, uh, the exterior portions of our electrical components are fit for operation in emergency environments. The charging port for this device will be located on the side of each chassis that holds the actuators. The device will only charge at rest and not at operation. An XD60 will be used that will deliver the power to all 10 batteries. During the operation, a cap can be placed on the exposed charging ports XD60 to ensure that water and debris will not enter and result in failure of the charging system. ESC were originally going to be contained in a separate housing component to keep them in place. However, we removed the housing since it prevented the removal of heat from the batteries and instead used the silicone ceramic bilayered technologies. The product we concluded would meet our design specifications for the battery foam was the T-Flex B200, a reliable compliant thermal material offering good thermal performance. It has high dielectric insulation which works to prevent dielectric breakdown and is made of ceramic filled silicone, a waterproof material. Placing this material in between the vents and battery allows us to properly vent the heat from the batteries without keep, while keeping unwanted water, dirt and oils outside. The foam has a tacky side used to attach the battery, ESC, and the chassis to hold them together structurally. Additionally, ribs inside the chassis were constructed to hold the batteries, ESCs, and foam together without falling apart. Vents were also installed in the chassis to admit heat, and charging ports were installed on the back side of the chassis to charge the batteries when not used. <clears throat> the easiest method to manufacture our chassis involves using plastic injection molding with polycarbonate. Since there is no tapping required on the screws, we can create a mold to use to create these parts. The chassis must be able to hold the actuators, batteries, and CPU. The latter two components are to be separated from the actuators so that dirt, water, or oils do not get into the chassis. These components will also require vents such that heat dissipation occurs, and the chassis is designed in two main parts such that easy installation and swapping of inner components is achieved with adhesive present for loose components. Socket head screws are used to ensure minimal interference with the smoothness of the chassis. We initially designed two different chassis configurations, but decided to make identical components for each side of the stretcher. The figure shows the final chassis design after numerous iterations. For simplicity, the chassis was broken into two components, the top and the bottom, and these two components are very similar, allowing for easy revisions and updates. Chassis features uh, include a base large enough to uh, the components within the chassis, holes with room for quarter inch socket head screws, and fan holders with cuts and wiring holes.
Ribs and vents are also inside the chassis to hold the batteries, ESCs, and foam together while also ventilating, and mounts were also attached to the corner of the chassis and the bottom of the chassis. Finally, the electrical components were placed along with the power button, ensuring that the CPU would remain separate from the batteries and ESCs to allow for easier exchange of parts. The assembly of all components was fairly simple to integrate given the comprehensive design of the chassis and the figure shows integration of the parts for the module. The final chosen configuration for the modules was a device horizontal to the ground in parallel with the stretcher offset from the stretcher itself. This configuration was chosen to avoid receiving the weight of the stretcher at the bottom, which may crush the modules when the patient is placed on the stretcher. We believe that the mounting system is strong enough with enough points of contact such that the device will not slip rotate or translate around the stretcher bars. This is yet to be confirmed through testing. The assembly is designed to be able to fit in this formation on any stretcher. Though we have only been given one CAD model stretcher, we have been given drawings of other stretchers to be able to confirm this assumption. This configuration also ensures that we will have similar kinematic properties such as moment arm every time we mount the modules on the stretcher. Next, we will discuss our system dynamics. To model the stretcher, we obtained the CAD model from LSC, which is the most widely used helicopter litter. We applied the correct material data to get an accurate center of mass and inertia, which we can use to approximate the stretcher as a rotating box for our mathematical formulation and kinematic simulations. We also modeled a human body as part of our system. The Department of Defense has anthropometric data of the human body based on a sample size of 66. We took the size, mass, inertia data for a standing individual and applied it to a model lying down. We have a total of five bodies for our simulation, covering the average body, three stand deviations above and below that average, a 150 kilogram body that represents the max payload for an HHO, and an empty stretcher with no payload. To model the disturbance, we did some research on the maximum wind speed that a helicopter will fly in, as well as the maximum downwash wind speed the stretcher will experience. Combining this with the stretcher surface area and moment arm allow us to calculate the maximum possible torque seen by the stretcher. The details of this calculation can be found in our system dynamics document, but at the end of the day, we don't expect to see more than 78 newton meters of torque exerted on the stretcher. While we know the upper bound, we really have no idea what the torque over time looks like in real life. In order to approximate what it looks like in real life, we'll give our system many different inputs and hope that some of them approximate real life. In order to do this, we created a disturbance modeling toolbox that includes basis disturbances like gusts, sinusoidals, and steps, which can be added and combined to create a library of unique test scenarios. Here are some examples of disturbance models created with our toolbox. On the left, we have a large gust on top of some sinusoid. In the middle, we have a large step accompanied with sinusoidal behavior. And on the right, we have two large gusts in opposite directions on top of low frequency sinusoids. For the actuation modeling, our analytical simulation assumes that thrust is directly proportional to the PWM input. And we also assume that the propellers have zero rotational inertia, meaning they can change RPM instantaneously. For Webots, we also assume the thrust is directly proportional to the PWM input. However, in Webots, the propellers have some non-zero rotational inertia, meaning the, in the realism of the simulation is increased. As we move our testing into Webots, we'll adjust our uh, algorithm parameters to account for these changes in simulation realism. For the mathematical formulation, we assume that torque from the cable and torque from wind resistance are negligible. Using this, we can derive the angular acceleration of the stretcher about its center, given an external torque, moment arm, and actuator thrust. Finally, we can calculate the angular velocity of the stretcher over time using calculus. 
For the mathematical formulation, we defined our state as the angular velocity and angular acceleration, our inputs as the actuator forces, our disturbance as the external torque, and our outputs as the measured angular velocity. Combining all these, we derived our state equation and output equation seen below. Uh, below are the safety measure derivations. On this slide, you can see a table using the constants used for the safety measure derivation. Uh, T is the time, R is the distance of the patient's head to the center of rotation. Theta, omega, and alpha are angle, angular velocity, and angular acceleration, respectively. X, V, A, and J are position, velocity, acceleration, and jerk, respectively. U, R, and U, T are the radial and tangential unit vectors. V, T, A, T, and A, R are the tangential and radial velocities and accelerations. Uh, uh, at the very top, we see the definition of the position vector X of T to be in the same direction as the stretcher. Uh, we take the derivative of x of t with respect to time to obtain v of t. We take the derivative of v of t with respect to time to obtain a of t. And then we have, take the derivative with respect to time of a of t to obtain j of t. Uh, we define the unit radial vector to be uh, in the same direction of the stretcher. And we define the unit tangential vector to be in the direction tangential to the current direction of the stretcher. We obtain tangential velocity, tangential acceleration, and ten radial acceleration by taking the projection of the velocity and acceleration vectors onto UR and UT. As we can see, the velocity, the, the tangential velocity is equal to uh, R times omega T. The absolute value of the tangential acceleration is equal to R times absolute value of alpha T. And the tangential radial acceleration, uh, sorry, the absolute value of the radial acceleration is equal to r times omega t squared. Now, instead of finding the tangential or radial jerk, we just opted to take the magnitude of the jerk, which resulted in this formula at the end. Uh, from our research, we found that, that the human spine can endure a maximum of 5 g's of acceleration in the direction parallel to the spine and 10 g's of acceleration in the direction perpendicular to the spine. Uh, people who might use our stretcher may be injured, so we divide the two values discussed before by 10 to yield an upper bound on radial and tangential acceleration with a high safety factor. Uh, so this results in an upper bound on radial acceleration of 0.5 g, which then in turn results in an upper bound on angular velocity to be 2.11 radians per second. Uh, then this also results in a bound on tangential acceleration of 1g, and then this results in an upper bound on angular acceleration of 8.91 radians per second squared. So here's a summary of our safety measures. Uh, we have an upper bound on angular velocity to be 2.11 radians per second. We have an upper bound on angular acceleration to be 8.91 radians per second. And we have a jerk formula used to evaluate comfort. For algorithm controller, our goal is to derive the structure angular velocity to zero, which requires to reject any wind disturbance. PID controller is the best case, uh, best candidate to solve this problem. Our job is to define appropriate proportional gain KP and integral gain KI and derivative gain KD such that our requirement of safety measure are met. According to the dynamic system, we have figured out the rotational inertia for test case, we tune the PID with our rotational inertia, which is 26 kilogram meter square. By doing that, we got the parameter and test this with the other case with the disturbance in range of 12 to 20 Newton meter. And you can see the angle of velocity is under threshold value for these two case. The same happened for the other two case. So this result, the controller only met one requirement, but we decided to use this PID as initial controller. We did test this controller with more complicated disturbance in physics-based simulator we bought so that we could evaluate whether the controller could meet all the requirements. We decided to not change the initial 
PID controller since the data collected from Gleebot is so good resource. This will be clarified more in the next few slides about how we implement Gleebot's setup and data analysis. We have designed for um for transfer function, we have designed our controller to have lag gain at low frequency where we expect to see most of the disturbance at our crossover frequency at up, uh, 3.16 radian per second, we have a comfortable phase machine of about 89.8 degree according to body diagram. This result in a delay machine of about 0.5 seconds. Um, so to reduce the jerk from tiny noise induced adjustments, we implemented a low pass filter on the last 21 sensor readings. This adds a 10, millis, 10 millisecond delay, but greatly reduce jerks. After some experimentation, we settled on a window um, since FIR filter with 100 Hz cutoff frequencies. As expected, the filter reduced a small controller adjustment, reducing jerk greatly. In the following example, we compare the result for the actuated structure with a low pass filter and with um without a low pass filter and with a low pass filter subject to an arbitrary disturbance. Um figure A is jerk before low pass and figure B is jerk after low pass. Although the filter has 10 milliseconds of delay, it reduced the jerk greatly. We expect that a real life structure is not compl completely rigid and that the propeller cannot instant, uh, instantaneously produce tiny just, uh, adjustment. Thus, the um, actual jerk experience in real life is slightly lower than in our simulation. Regardless, the low pass future is worldwide trade-off. Use the Webots as our simulation tool to validate the results of the numerical simulation. Through this, we can model our stretcher body device system as a combined robot with sensors, actuators, and approximate external wind disturbances. We imported the simplified models of our system components to satisfy Webot's requirements, which provided accurate results with overridden mass and inertia values. Here's our master node tree for the Webot's environment. Some key features of this environment are the supervisor node, which we use to add direct disturbances as the external torque, the connector, which we use to strap in our body and attach our device to the stretcher model, and the hinge joint, which restricts the degrees of freedom to just spin. This emulates the spin of the system about a cable. We also have sensors to track angular velocities, accelerations, and jerks to feed to the actuators. Webots also uses the same controller as our numerical simulation and handles the data collection. We implemented various test cases for our system to run in Webots. Along with our library of disturbance models, we also ran a multi-trial uncertainty analysis based on noise and errors from our physical sensors and actuators. We also tested our disturbances on all five volume models with different inertial situations, ranging from no payload to a maximum payload of 150 kilograms to evaluate the robustness of our system and controller. We also varied the location of the patient in the stretcher to see the effect of the inertial imbalance. This included two cases where the head and the feet of the patient are at either end of the stretcher. Finally, we varied the location of the modules at the end of the stretcher to account for imperfect installation. This included a case where one module is off-center from the center of mass, a case where both modules are off-center in the same direction, and one where both modules were off-center in different directions. All of these test cases were performed to ensure our controller was robust in a variety of scenarios. This is our data analysis section. Uh, for our gust external torque disturbances, we have eight of these disturbances. The amplitude varies from five newton meters to 75 newton meters, and the duration for each is about three seconds. Uh, for our sine external torque disturbances, we have 16 of these disturbances. The amplitude varies from one newton meter to 25 newton meters. We have a low Low frequency period of five seconds and a high frequency period of 2.5 seconds. The bias varies from zero to 20 newton meters. This results in sine torque disturbances that range from zero newton meters to around 45 newton meters. 
torque. Uh, for our external torque disturbances per step, we have 15 of these disturbances. The max value ranges from 5 newton meters to 45 newton meters. The midpoint always occurs at around 10 seconds, and the slope parameter varies from 1 to 4. For our miscellaneous disturbances, uh, it is a combination of sine, step, and gust disturbances. The first five of these disturbances last 30 seconds, and the last two last for about 60 seconds. We are showing the result for gust K on the empty threshold since the empty threshold should be the worst case scenario. As you can see, the ground to angular velocity is under 50 pounds. We are showing filter angular velocity here because PID controller use it as input to control the system. That is also under 50 pounds. The radial acceleration of empty threshold is also under 50 pounds for gust case scenario. Same as absolute tangential acceleration. The just case uh, for jerk is kind of hard to analyze with this graph. So we use um, moving average without lag to smooth it out. So here's the result. And you can see the empty pressure for compensated case is much lower than uncompensated case. Um, we only saw the gust case for empty pressure, but according to our result, all the other disturbance results also met the, the safety requirement. As the payload increase, the results are getting better due to the increased rotational inertia. We, we can conclude that the controller can handle payload variance well, and the safety requirement will met. For patient positioning variance, we have three cases. The head case, where the head of the patient is closer to the edge of the stretcher. The tail case, where the foot of the patient is closer to the edge of the stretcher. And the center case, where the center of mass of the patient is in alignment with the center of mass of the stretcher. The graph on the left shows a difference in angular velocity between the head and center case. And the graph on the right shows a difference in angular velocity between the tail and center case. The fact that these graphs have negative values imply that the center case always has a greater angular velocity, making the center case the worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario is when the center of mass of the body aligns with the center of mass of the stretcher. However, in all our tests, the controller passed the safety requirements in this worst case scenario. Here is the result of divide positioning variance with two modular off in the same direction on miscellaneous disturbance with average body. As you can see, the ground to angle of velocity is under safety bow. The radial acceleration is also under safety bow. Same as absolute tangential acceleration. According to the uh, according to our result from summation, the controller also met the requirement for the other two cases of divide position in RAN. So we can conclude that the controller is able to stabilize the structure even though device is positioned off center. Uh, for statistical analysis, we found out that randomness in trials is generated from the IMU noise, which measures angular velocity. This value is then filtered and fed into our PID controller. So to examine the effect of randomness in our trials, uh, we could have just examined filtered angular velocity. To do this, we ran every disturbance on average body three times. We took the standard deviation values of filtered angular velocity for each disturbance. And then we calculated percent difference between mean filtered angular velocity and ground truth angular velocity for each disturbance. Uh, for the, here, on this slide, we show plots of maximum standard deviation for uh, uh, versus disturbance for gust and sine. As you can see, the standard deviation is very small on the scale of 10 to the negative third and 10 to the negative fourth, and does not compare to the actual measured angular velocity. Uh, here is the same. We show the maximum standard deviation versus disturbance number for step and miscellaneous disturbances. Once again, the standard deviation is very small and does not compare to the actual measured angular velocity. Here is an example of showing how standard deviation does not compare to actual measured angular velocity. Uh, we have plotted the mean three standard deviations above and three standard deviation below of filtered angular velocity for one gust disturbance. As you can see, that all looks like the same line, showing how randomness uh, really does not play that big of an impact in the filtered angular velocity measurements. Uh, here are the graphs showing percent difference between uh, ground truth angular velocity and the mean of the filtered angular velocities. Uh, sometimes uh, these graphs spike up to infinity, but this happens when the ground truth approaches zero. Normally we can see that the percent difference is between zero and 2%, which makes sense because our IMU outputs 2% noise. 
Here, these graphs show the percent difference for the first gust disturbance and the first sign disturbance. So, uh, the, the same is shown for the first step disturbance and the first miscellaneous. Load simulations were performed to determine the validity of our CAD designs. We wanted to make sure that our parts operated normally under our most strenuous test conditions. Load tests were done in SOLIDWORKS and industry approved software. In this simulation, the entire device was matched with the curvature based option for more refined results. The example bars were held fixed, and a total of 16 newtons was applied where the actuator applies its force onto the chassis. In the area of maximum stress accumulation, the factor of safety is 140, passing our requirements with flying colors. The maximum stress predictably was accumulated on the mounting harbor. Also important to note is that this is a true scale for deformation and to the naked eye, no deformation can be seen. The entire assembly has over 190 components. So to get a more detailed analysis of how our chassis behaved, we ran a simulation where the chassis halves were given a global, no penetration contact set, and the faces where mounting hardware bolts onto the bottom chassis half were held fixed. Bolt connectors were also used to increase the realism of this simulation. The same force was applied as before, and the highest stress point on the chassis still had a factor of safety of 64. Both pieces are made of PC high viscosity plastic. Von Mises stress is shown on the right, and nowhere does it, approve, does it approach the yield strength of this material, which is 6.27 times 10 to the 7 pascals. The point of highest stress is on the inside of the bottom half of the chassis. If necessary, we can apply fillets to the internal geometry of the chassis or thicken the walls. But because of the high factor of safety, even on the most stressed portion, we do not need to make any alterations at this time. We are confident that our system will stay rigid and hold together. Our device operates at turbulent environments with several actuators. This means that the system receives several types of frequencies, such as from the helicopter, structure, winds, torque, and mainly its own actuators. It's important to check if any of these frequencies arrive at the device's natural resonant frequency and affect the device through deformation or threats to critical locations. That generally, the frequencies are always dynamic and small, both from the exterior and the actuators, and the device will not experience constant resonance for there to be a large problem. However, conducting this test it is important to understand the specifications of our product. So a natural frequency analysis was conducted on the chassis in SOLIDWORKS simulation. The end result came up with five resonant mode shapes and their res respective resonances defined as shown. The five resonant frequencies to avoid via the controller was found as 51, 97, 183, 230, and 256 hertz. Mode four was the only mode shape that could have affected the electrical components, but due to the electrical housing serving as protection and in constant nature of the frequency experienced and the small frequency wave of the actuator, no critical components will fail due to resonance. Additionally, we conducted some simulations post-CDR. The first simulation we conducted was an airflow analysis to determine if the direction of flow was interrupted by the chassis or the other actuator. We determined that the lines of velocity only increased near the inlet of the fan, meaning that the actuator placement and the chassis size has negligible effect on the air velocity of the fan. Uh, the output velocity of the air is very high, as you can see with the lighter horizontal lines coming out of the actuator, showing that the fan is capable of providing high thrust in this orientation. We also conducted tests to simulate the mount contacts on SOLIDWORKS, showing that in our operating conditions of 2G, there is no slippage of the grips after initial adjustments. This shows that our mounts are strong enough to transfer the thrust from the module onto the stretcher in both the vertical and horizontal directions based on our operating conditions. With Peter's help and investigation, we determined that the estimated heat generation from the ESC is 13.2 watts. We also determined that for the 10 batteries, the heat generated is 3.3 watts each. Uh, the methods used to um, for, were to research the current of each component, then determine the internal resistance from similar batteries and research papers. We determined that the temperature on the chassis reaches about 230 degrees Fahrenheit at parts non-critical to the design, while other critical parts maintain temperatures negligible compared to the heat generation created. 
These are merely estimates and proper testings with our specific ESCs and batteries will determine the actual temperature of operation. Structural analysis was finally conducted on the actuator tabs and the chassis to test one, if the chassis can withstand the forces we are expecting from the wind and actuators, and two, if the actuator tabs can withstand those reaction forces it creates on the chassis. In both test cases, the maximum stress generated was about 30 times less than the yield, showing that the tabs and chassis are structurally robust. One main area of future work would be to expand our system to three degrees of freedom. Currently, we simplified our system to one degree of freedom, which is spin about the cable axis. We focused on this for the scope of the project because spin is the main cause of patient blackout and injury. In order to account for the sway of the stretcher system, we would need to model it as a spinning mass on a pendulum. This would involve adjusting our control for linear velocities and accelerations, as well as implementing states-based tracking to control actuation, since you are removing many of our constraints. We would also need to model the rope and hang stretcher in VBOTS and have a more complex wind disturbance model than simplifying to only external torques. In the future, a major decision that will have to be made is whether or not to enter prototyping or production right away. Prototyping would allow us to save costs as we continue to perfect our design and allow us to conduct more research into manufacturing methods, design specifications, and market estimations. Production would also require a heavy investment, but would allow us to compete earlier in a relatively open market with few competitors. This decision would lay the foundation for our future work on this project. This project has proven to be a valuable learning experience in how to research and design a product, integrating multiple teams and parts into one final product. As team jury, we want to express our thanks to Dr. Mehta, Dr. Rosen, Peter, and Yisuke for their guidance and advice these past two quarters and our gratitude for the experience. We hope to continue to hone these skills uh, we developed through this class and wish you all the best in the future.